everyone. This one is very dark. I need to give some disclaimers for stories number one and two, for sexual assault and abuse, and for domestic violence in story number four. I'll have all the stories labeled in a pinned comment in case you want to avoid any of them. If you have a story similar to any of these that you'd like to share, you can send it at southerncannibal.com. And without any more interruptions, let's get started. And remember, to always, stay hungry. I want to give a disclaimer for sexual harassment and serious abuse, as well as brief mention of self-harm. I'm honestly not sure if this is considered scary or really just sad, but I felt a lot of fear during this time of my life. For some backstory, I had always grown up poor. Everything started when my dad ended up collapsing in the hospital when visiting my mom, who was regularly ill. I was a preteen at the time, so they discharged my mom and I was with her. We were in a tough spot later and she asked me if I would be okay living with my grandparents. So I said sure, biggest mistake of my life. Throughout the years, my grandparents would verbally and emotionally abuse me and gaslight me. My grandfather was especially horrible to me and even would sexually abuse me, even though I wouldn't recognize this until recently. My grandparents threatened to beat me and destroy my belongings multiple times. Every time I would try to confront them about it, they would scream and yell at me about trying to lie to make them look bad. They turned it around and made me feel like shit, telling me that I was the one abusing them. Unfortunately, I believed them, and every time I tried to make them so much as own up to their abuse, I would end up sobbing and then begging for forgiveness. I was constantly in fear. They were very uptight about my grades. One time I got screamed at and also lectured for being happy about achieving a B on a final exam. Their uptightness about my grades really wore me down over time. I was always walking on eggshells. I refused to check my grades because I would just be terrified of what they would be. I would be terrified of what they were going to scream at me about next. They would pull on my hair and yell at me when I try to move away. My grandfather would touch my butt and thighs even when I begged him to stop and moved away from him. He would always whine about me pushing him away. My heart would never stop racing. I'm panicked so much just thinking about what they put me through. I oftentimes felt like I was being choked I was panicking so bad. I was always in a state of fear and wondering when I'd get screamed at. I'd fear being beaten. I couldn't even cry because they'd scream and yell at me for that. One time in one of my classes, I straight up couldn't breathe because I was freaking out about my grandfather so damn bad. My friends were concerned. I told my friends that I didn't want to go home. I felt so scared, so hopeless. I sometimes hid in the bathroom for long periods of time out of fear. Sometimes I'd fear my grandfather would sexually harass me even worse. And once I hid in the bathroom for two hours because I was terrified of him. He would make creepy comments about my bras and what scented stuff I used. Because of my large bust size, I have to get more expensive bras, and prior to getting appropriately fitting bras, I was wearing sports bras. When I got properly fitting bras, my grandfather made a comment about how my bra looked like it fit much better now, and I felt so creeped out. My grandparents had an indoor pool at one of their properties. One time they made me go swimming. I was 14 at the time. I had to wait for my grandfather to remove the cover from the pool and his friend was coming over, so I went to the basement to wait in my swimsuit. My grandfather came down to tell me that he got the cover off, but before I could go up the stairs, he then said to me, Don't worry about my friend. He's seen pretty girls before, and he then slapped my butt. He would make comments about liking my coconut scented shampoo and then sniff my hair. I was so creeped out by him and terrified that I would try to sit down away from him or I would lean against a wall when food was being served so that he couldn't slap my butt. I really hated going home to see him. He made my life hell. 
He refused to let me get therapy, despite other family offering to pay and take me. He only allowed after I hurt myself twice and had a mental breakdown after one of their screaming fits, where I repeatedly wanted to hurt myself along with the mean things they screamed at me, to which he threatened to take me to a mental hospital and that what I said wasn't even true, despite him having him said those things 10 minutes earlier. I'm honestly sorry if this isn't that scary to you, but this is my trauma, and for me, it was absolutely terrifying. Fortunately now, I'm free of him for three weeks, now at 17. If anyone else out there has dealt with what I have, recognize the abuse and get out. Your very own family are sometimes the ones who cause you the most fear and give you nightmares. Be careful out there. I have never shared this story with anyone outside of my parents and the police involved at the time. I probably won't share a lot of the details here. My husband doesn't even know all of it. It's been 26 years since this happened, but it still brings me out in waves of nausea, sweating, heavy breathing, and general panic. I have changed the names for privacy but mainly because I still can't say the name of my former friend's dad without getting that panicked feeling. I met Trudy in the first year of high school, 11 years old here in the UK, and instantly hit it off. We became instant best friends. There wasn't really anything we didn't have in common. Many of our classes were together, so we spent classes, breaks, lunch, and sometimes even after school together. She got to know my family, and I got to know hers. My parents weren't overly fond of her, but my parents could be snobs, as they were comfortable with money. Trudy's parents didn't work, and they lived on benefits. And they didn't have much, but it didn't bother me. She was my best friend. Her mom and dad were really nice at first. Her mom Sarah would bake us things, and then insist I go on days out with them. Her dad would pick me up and drop me off to the days out. I would walk with Trudy to the school for the disabled, as Trudy had an older sister who went to the school because she had severe mental disabilities, and I would wait in the car with Trudy's dad, Ben, while Trudy and her mom went to pick up Allison at home time. They would then drop me off at home after school. It was during one of these waiting moments that things changed with Ben. The first time he put his hand on my leg, I was 12. It made me flinch, but I didn't understand why, and I really felt stupid afterwards because all he was doing was talking, and he made it seem normal. The next time he did it, his hand was higher, and he squeezed my thigh. But once again, he was just talking about random things like school or outings or family. This became the norm for quite some time, but what I remember now that he would always remove his hand just before Trudy and her mom got back. I was 14 when he went in for his first kiss. We had to pull up to Trudy's older brother's house to drop some things off. And once again, Ben and I stayed in the car while Trudy and Sarah went into the house. We weren't really talking about anything in particular when Ben leaned over and kissed me. I was facing him when he leaned in at me, but I turned my face in time that he only kissed my cheek. He then asked me if I was embarrassed, and I said no. I was extremely embarrassed, but I didn't want to be rude. I had seen him do this with Allison, so I thought once again I was being stupid. Over the next couple of years, this behavior continued. Hands on my thighs, rubbing my shoulders, really long tight hugs, kisses goodbye or hello. But I never figured till later that all this was done away from Trudy and Sarah. The last time anything happened, I was 16. Trudy and her family had moved away, as Trudy had gotten pregnant, and they decided to move to a bigger house now that there would be a need for more space. I visited their house less and less, but Trudy and I still stayed in touch by phone every night. Trudy had her baby, and I was invited over to spend the night, as she wanted to tell me something. So after my parents agreed, Ben picked me up. When we got to their house, I found out that Sarah had taken a nasty fall and she had pins put in her leg so she was sleeping downstairs. Ben would be in Trudy's room and I and Trudy would be in Ben and Sarah's room with the baby. 
The news Trudy had that she wanted to ask me is if I would like to be her baby's godmother. I was ecstatic by this, and I said yes. Her parents said goodnight, and Trudy and I stayed up talking until about 2 in the morning. At first, I wasn't quite sure what woke me up. I was usually a good sleeper, and it was still dark outside. I was laid on my front with my head facing away from Trudy, both legs stretched downwards. As I was waking up, I felt something under the covers around my mid area, and I realized my nightie was slightly pulled up and my underwear was moving. And then I felt it, and I think I went into shock because I couldn't move. I couldn't even talk, even though at this point all I wanted to do was scream for Trudy, or anyone really. It was only now that the dark room was coming into focus, and I could see Ben shirtless on the floor at my side of the bed. One hand under the covers doing what it should not have been doing to me, and the other on himself. He whispered to me to be quiet, and that if we went to his room, we could do things better. I managed to shake of my head, and then he just said, Fine. Maybe next time. He then stood up, and that's when I noticed that he had no clothes on at all, and his excitement was visible. I laid there for hours not being able to sleep and just watching the door. I didn't cry. I didn't wake Trudy. I didn't do anything but just lay there like a statue. I had no idea what to do. The next morning as I was getting dressed, Trudy and Sarah were in the kitchen with Allison and the baby. Ben came into the bedroom and then said, You're not going to tell anyone, right? But it didn't sound like a question, but more of a demand. I left shortly after that, and I made excuses to not ever go back, but I still spoke to Trudy on the phone. It was a few months later while at college that in one of the lessons, it was taking us through the different types of abuse people suffer from that I broke down in class, and the full extent of what happened to me then hit me like a freight train. I cried. I was sweating and shaking, and my chest hurt. I thought I was going to pass out. I couldn't talk. When I eventually calmed down, I had spoke to the counselor on site, and she recommended I tell my parents. She got me a taxi home, and I told my mom what happened. She in turn told my dad, and they rang the police. Two police officers arrived at the house a few hours later, and I told them the whole story from when I met Trudy to the very last time I spoke to Ben. They arrested Ben the next morning on charges of child abuse. The police had warned me that if Ben denied the charges, I may have to go to court. And as scared as I was, my parents said they would be there for me. But he didn't. He denied none of it. I was later told then he admitted to doing more to me, but I had no memory of these events. And I later found out that our brains will sometimes block out memories of trauma. I don't know what the more is that he did, as the police wouldn't give me that info, and I don't even want to know to be honest, but I think I'm thankful for the missing memories. This may sound strange to you, but for me, the worst part was not what he did to me, but later on the same day as Ben's arrest, both Trudy and Sarah rang me at home and shouted at me, asking me questions like why I would tell lies about him, why would I do that, that they now hate me for spreading lies and that he isn't like that. I just sat there crying, listening to them. It was my mom who put the phone down. I really felt guilty for breaking their family. Ben was sentenced to three years in prison and got out after 15 months, and he was then put on the sex offender register, and because they had a vulnerable person in the house, the family was also investigated by CPS, Child Protection Services. Because of what I went through, I am now hypervigilant with both of my own children. I unfortunately now find it very difficult to trust anyone. One of the people in my life that I should have trusted and who should have been a protector ruined me, as well as the way I see life and the world. I want to thank Southern Cannibal for letting me tell my story. I'm at least grateful for being able to tell this somewhere. It was after all your channel that gave me the courage to do so. Take care and be safe out there, everyone. I'm a 26-year-old female. For the sake of this story, 
I'll be using the name Alexa as the details pertain to my family directly. The story occurred back around 2013. At this time, my family was going through some major hardships. My dad had just lost his longtime high paying job and had found a new one that didn't pay near as much. A detail that is important for this story is that my mom is a complete narcissist. She is also bipolar. This makes it hard to tell whenever she's being truthful or fake. Getting back to the story, my parents were also having trouble in their marriage around the time that my dad had lost his job. In no way does my mom care about the well-being of the family. She only cares about the things that other people can provide for her, such as money. So naturally, she was very angry with my dad, even though this wasn't at all his fault. Shortly after all this occurred, my dad started to develop a bad drinking habit, coupled with anger issues. My sister and I were frightened to talk with him or even be around him. It didn't help that my mom refused to acknowledge the problem, or even step in when my dad was being this way. He would snap at the slightest thing, and always assumed that everything we said was a personal attack on him. There were multiple times at which my parents had a big fight, and then one of them told us kids that they were getting a divorce. Yet the next day, both of them pretended as if we had made up the whole thing. At this point too, I was starting to get suspicious of at least one of them cheating in the marriage. This fact was later confirmed during the story I'm about to share. One day in question, my mom was scrolling through Facebook as she always did. She came across an old coworker of my dad's and decided to send him a friend request. Something that would be considerably normal, right? Well, my dad lost his shit. He started with yelling at my mom about how could she be friends with the enemy and a bunch of other things that only an insane person would say. Pretty soon he was extending all of his rage onto everyone in the house. My mom, sister, the dogs and all of us ran to my room and locked the door. The next hour of the day was spent crying and sitting in fear while my dad ran around the house screaming at the top of his lungs and banging on the door. My mom being the narcissist she is was again pretending like nothing was wrong and would not allow us to call the police. At that moment, another thought came to my mind. Why would my dad be reacting so harshly to my mom talking to another man? And why would my mom not be phased by it? I came to the conclusion that my dad was freaked out about catching her cheating because he was in fact the one cheating. The screaming and pounding on the door grew louder and louder by the minute. I had never feared for my own life like that before or since. Finally, he seemed to be done and he went downstairs to lock himself in his office. My sister and I stayed in my room for the rest of the day without making a single sound. The next morning, as expected, everyone pretended like nothing had happened. We were walking on eggshells for around a month after this until one last traumatizing event happened in the dead of night. My dad was working late, so it was just my sister, mom, and I at the house. We were all asleep when suddenly we heard a loud pounding at the front door. Scared, we all walked to the top of the stairs where we could slightly see outside onto the stoop. It was a woman, and apparently a woman my mother recognized because she proceeded to call my dad. All I remember was her screaming into the phone was, What have you fucking done to us? What have you done? All the while, the pounding on the door persisted. This is where my memory starts to fade. Maybe I was just too young to remember, or maybe my brain has blocked out the trauma. After that day, the dynamic of our family changed for good. My parents stopped trying with each other at all. They lost all love and respect for each other. Every day from then on until I moved out of the house, it was tense and you could feel the hatred. Since this all happened, I've moved out, gotten engaged, and I'm planning a wedding of my own. I need to express how difficult this is for me. For years, I've despised the idea of getting married and fear that my own relationship would end up like the one they had. I swore to never marry so that it would be easier to break things off if anything like this happened. However, 
I met the love of my life who I feel very safe and comfortable with. As for my parents, they're somehow still married. They live in utter misery every single day and waste away having no source of love or happiness in their life. To some, this might not be scary, but to me, this has impacted so many aspects of my life and I'm still working through everything in therapy. Stay safe, everyone, and always remember to spread as much love and happiness as you can. The world needs it. This story is going to contain the story of my Uncle Matt, who made me and my other family members fear for our own safety. It all leads up to what I consider the big event that really made us ban him from ever coming near any of us ever again. For some background, my Uncle Matt married my mom's sister when I was like four years old. He was in jail for aggravated assault for a few years after they got married, so I didn't really spend any time with him until I was around seven. My first true memory of him was when he showed up absolutely hammered at one of my soccer matches and started acting crazy on the sidelines, screaming and cussing at the kids that I was playing against, and just ruining the day for everyone. I think eventually someone threatened to call the cops, and that made him turn tail and leave since he was on parole. He and my aunt had three kids together, two girls and a little boy, over the span of about ten years. The eldest is about five years younger than me, so a lot of the time during my family gatherings I would spend time with her, which sadly meant I had to be near Matt. I don't think there was ever a time where he wasn't drunk off his ass. I seriously can't remember a single time that I saw him sober, but it was common knowledge that he was physically and verbally abusive to my aunt. On more than one occasion she would call my mom and make us come get her and the kids because he was beating her black and blue. And of course, we all told her to leave him. No matter what we said or how much help we offered, she always went back to him, and then he'd beat her again, and the cycle would continue. This went on for years, and we could tell it was affecting the children too. They were naughty, acting out and being violent, but who could blame them? Their whole lives were full of violence at home. There were a few times where someone in the family would call the cops or CPS, but nothing ever seemed to happen, and my aunt would always be furious that we had betrayed her trust just by trying to get her and the kids help. There was a time where she actually called the cops on him. Apparently they had been fighting, and their eldest had tried to get them to stop. She was maybe eight, and he tried to swing at her. That was what made her call, and when the cops showed up, they arrested him for domestic violence and terroristic threats because he had threatened to kill the officers. We were so happy for her, but not all good things last. Because within a few days, she had sold his PlayStation to bail him out of jail, and when he got home and saw that she had sold it, he beat her again for selling his stuff. Yeah, he truly was an evil man. Now I'll get on to a few short stories I can remember before getting to the main event of this tale. A few years after she called the cops on him, they were over at our house for a holiday. I can't for sure remember which one, but I think it was Easter. And so it was me and my parents, my brother, and their family of five. We didn't want Matt there, but we did want to spend some time with my aunt and cousins, and he just showed up with them. So their three kids and my younger brother were sitting at the table, while my mom and aunt dished up their lunch. I was helping while my dad and Matt were sitting in the living room in the next room over. My mom had given my brother a plate, and my aunt was setting up some plates in front of her kids. Well, since my mom didn't need to dish my food, she went and gave my dad his plate in the living room while I made my own. As my aunt was handing her youngest his plate, Matt came storming in, absolutely furious. He got in her face, pinning her back against the stove, and then he screamed at her that he should have been given his plate first, and not the kids. That he was the man of the house, and that she catered to him first. He was screaming so loud that it hurt my ears. He then grabbed the plate of food from the eldest kid, and shoved it at my aunt. He told her to put more food on it, and then said right in front of everyone, mind you, 
You ever do this shit again, I'm gonna saw your throat open. I was in shock, and so was my family. It was such a violent thing to say, especially over some food. And when I looked over at his kids to see their reactions, they were just sitting there. Heads down and faces blank, like this was just normal to them. And if they just stayed quiet, then it would soon be over. It was so heartbreaking, and none of us knew what to do. My aunt made him his plate, and he snatched it from her before going out into the living room. She then quietly made her eldest a new plate, and the kids began eating. I looked at my mom, and then quickly took my plate and ate in my room so I wouldn't have to be out there anymore. From that day on, I told my mom that if he was ever coming over to give me a heads up so I could hide in my room. Eventually, me and my older brother started hiding in our rooms if we knew they were coming over which was so sad because it made us not want to spend time with our cousins who we loved. He was just so terrifying to be around. Another incident happened later that summer. We had a small pop-up pool in our backyard that was about four feet deep. Just one of those circle ones sold at Walmart. So my mom came into my room and asked if I wanted to go swimming with her, my aunt, and my cousins. And I said yes. Matt wasn't there, so I put on a two-piece bikini and was about to leave my room when my mom came flying back in. I also want to add that I was roughly 13 or 14 at the time. She looks over at me and then says, Matt just showed up and he wants to swim too. I instantly put on a shirt and some shorts and swam fully clothed. He was just really creepy and I knew my mom was looking out for me. So a few minutes later, all seven of us are in this cheap little pool, and he says he wants to make us a wave pool. So we all start walking in a circle to make the water spin, which was fun, but I noticed his two younger kids struggling. The middle kid was maybe seven, and the youngest was like four, and was holding on to his mom in the ledge of the pool. Well, those two were obviously struggling with touching the floor of the pool, and the middle kid kept slipping under the water, and the youngest was getting teary-eyed because he wasn't allowed to let go of his mom since the water was moving too fast for him to float. So all of us stopped spinning the water, except for Matt. He kept walking, and he started getting frustrated that we weren't helping him keep the pool spinning. His middle kid looked like she was damn near drowning, so I snagged her arm and I pulled her to the ladder so she could hang on to it and then catch her breath. The water then slowly stopped spinning since nobody was helping, and he got pissed, saying things along the lines of nobody wanting to help him make this day fun, or that he was sick of trying to make the kids happy when they didn't appreciate it, although he used much more colorful language. He then moved over to the ladder to get out of the pool, and since his kid was on it, he grabbed her arm and pulled her off and pretty much flung her into the pool so he could climb out. I was right there, so I caught her, and I kept her above the water. And as I looked over shocked at my mom, she looked like a deer in the headlights just like me. His kids then started happily swimming in the pool now that he was gone, and my aunt lit up a cigarette like nothing had even happened. The kids were so happy to use the pool that they overlooked all the crazy things that he did so that they could keep swimming. It was so sad to see how normal this abuse was for them. There were a few other things here and there that he did, but I think it's time to get to the main event. By this time in the story, I was 16, and on the day in question, my dad and his brother were fixing a window in our living room. My Uncle Tom's kids were over, two girls aged 7 and 8, and they were running around the house playing. My 12-year-old brother was in his room playing video games, and my mom was in the kitchen. I was also in my room watching TV, when I then heard a truck pull up outside. For context, my family lives deep into the countryside, and we're the only house for miles, and we have a long driveway that leads up to the house, so cars pulling up doesn't happen often. I go into the living room, and I see my mom pressed against the front door looking through the peephole window thing. I ask what's up, and she says that Matt pulled up alone which is really weird since he's never been to our house by himself. So that made me nervous. But my dad and Tom were here, so I figured everything would be fine. But just to be safe, 
I told Tom's kids to go to my brother's room and play with him in there. They head off, and my brother comes out just a few moments later, asking why we sent the girls to go to his room. Once we explained that Matt was there, he just went back to his room, and he let the girls play with his video games and movies. My mom is still looking out the people, and I'm hovering nearby wondering what's going on. Like I said, him being there alone was way out of character, and that's never happened before. So part of me was worried that he'd done something to his family. After about an hour, my dad comes into the house, and he tells my mom that he and my uncle have to go buy something to finish fixing up the window, and that they told Matt to leave. I didn't like the fact that they were going to leave us there alone while Matt was in the area. My mom is thin as a rail, and I'm only five foot three. The only other people in the house were two children and my baby brother. So we weren't really the dream team to fight off a stocky man who was over six feet tall and who was probably drunk. My mom told dad that, but he said that he would stay until Matt left and then they would be back as quick as possible. So cue my dad and Uncle Tom standing by Matt's truck while he makes up excuses to stall for time. He was getting in and out of the truck, saying he lost his phone. After a few minutes, my dad told him to check his pockets, and there it was. So then Matt said he couldn't find his keys, which he had in his hand a few minutes before this whole thing started. So he starts climbing around the cab in his truck and scouring the ground outside, looking for the keys. He kept saying things like, You guys can go ahead and head to the store. I'll leave as soon as I find my keys. Hoping they would leave without watching him leave. But my Uncle Tom climbed into the truck and then found the keys sitting right in the cup holder. Super obvious and visible. He then tossed them to Matt, who was visibly drunk. Now, I don't condone drinking and driving at all, but we just wanted him gone for our safety. And the road we live on doesn't have many people on it so we figured there was a very low chance of him crashing into someone. After a few more minutes of him just sitting in the truck, he finally starts it and slowly drives away. My dad and Tom then get into their car and drive off to go to the store, which is roughly half an hour away. My mom and I both had a bad feeling, so we stayed in the living room and watched out of the windows while then chatting about how weird that all was. When maybe about five minutes later, we hear that truck pull up again. Matt's truck goes flying down the driveway, and he parked diagonally, locking in mine and mom's car so there's no way for us to leave. Another thing, whenever family came over, no matter who it was, they always parked in the grass next to the house, not behind our cars. He parked in the grass earlier, but for some reason, he decided to block us in now that the men were gone. Mom and I both went into panic mode and both made the realization that he blocked us in on purpose. She told me to run and get my brother and my cousins, so that's what I did. I gave my brother the rundown of the situation and we both got the girls out to the living room. My mom was panicking and we were thinking about what to do. We had no neighbors, nowhere to run to and we were at least 10 miles from the nearest town. Since the window by the front door was broken, I was able to stick my head out and see that since my dad and Tom took my dad's car, Tom's was actually still parked in the grass by the house. We had one shot to get to the car before Matt got over to us, and we didn't even know where the keys were. So I picked up a kid while my brother picked up the other one, and then my mom let us out of the house full sprint. When we got to the car, we threw the girls in, and my brother climbed in the back after them. I dove into the passenger seat while my mom got into the driver's seat. We frantically started looking for the keys, and thankfully they were sitting right in the cup holder. So my mom started the car, and we peeled out of the driveway without even taking the time to buckle up. We drove into town while my mom called my dad and told him what happened. My dad did a full U-turn, and he drove home ASAP while we then drove to my grandma's house. Me and my brother and one of the girls didn't even have shoes on, and when we pulled up to my grandma, she looked confused and worried for us. My mom then quietly explained what happened to her, and she ushered us into the house. Because grandmas are the best, 
She had ordered us some food and put on some movies for us until my dad called my mom back. Matt wasn't at the house. He must have left right after us, and my dad couldn't find any signs that he'd broken in or anything. But we were really spooked out enough that we decided to stay at Grandma's until my dad had finished a shopping trip with my other uncle. When we got home, we were pretty shaken up, and we told my dad everything that happened, and he was most certainly not happy. But he thought that we were overreacting slightly. He didn't think Matt would actually hurt any of us, but my mom and I begged to differ. It was just so premeditated him showing up alone, trying to stall leaving until my dad left, and then him coming right back after the men were gone and him blocking the cars in. I feel like he had really bad intentions. I mean, he was such an evil person already, and I don't doubt that he was capable of hurting us. After that day, I told my parents that Mad was absolutely not allowed on the property anymore, even if that meant we couldn't see my aunt and cousins. Thankfully, my aunt had decided to leave him after that, and they've been separated for about six years. He's never tried to contact her or the kids since, and I think that's for the best. The kids are doing so much better without him terrorizing their lives, and I have a strong bond with each of them, which is lucky since I'm sure we've all heard about the stories of abusers going off the deep end when their victims try to leave. So that's the story of my crazy Uncle Matt, who abused, terrified, and beat his family, and who I really think was trying to do something horrible to my mother and I. If you're ever in an abusive situation, please seek help. My aunt and her kids are healing, and they're very happy now, now that they're free from him. Be careful. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always, stay up.